Cal Poly football is in a familiar spot once again. With five losses on the season, the playoff hopes for the teams are dwindling. And the road won't get any easier tonight. The number eight team in the conference is in town. And we'll see how that plays out. Hello and welcome to Mustang Game Day. I'm Brian Strong. And I'm Sydney Finkel. Cal Poly taking on Sacramento State this weekend, currently undefeated in the Big West Conference. So kind of a tough matchup tonight. Um, last week's game against North Dakota had kind of a dramatic ending. Cal Poly up almost the entire game. And now uh, with less than two minutes left, kind of a switch of scores there. Let's go ahead and take a look at some of those highlights. Start off in the first quarter, the toss to Drew Hernandez. 29-yard run to push the Mustangs up the field. We'll slow it down a bit in a second. You can actually see at the end of his run just how hard he is to bring down with his speed and his agility. He just doesn't want to get off those two feet. A little later in the game here, it's Hamler with the run to bring it in for another touchdown. Gives the Mustangs the lead. A little celebration there. And then with less than a minute left in the half, it's Hamler with the completion to receiver J.J. Koski. A gain of 22 yards to march the Mustangs up the field. To complete the drive, it's Quentin Harrison in the corner of the end zone. Give the Mustangs a bit of breathing room before the halftime. Quentin barely able to get his feet in there, but a quick touchdown before halftime. North Dakota responds in the third quarter with a touchdown, but it's Harrison again with this 52-yard kickoff return. Marching down the field. Just a few minutes later, it's Trans Samson bulldozing his way onto the end zone for a touchdown. Look at this different view. You can see just how much power he brings, making sure he crosses that line. And into the fourth quarter, the into the fourth quarter, the field goal is good from the 42 by Colton Theaker. Well, with under what? two minutes to play, North Dakota responds with this touchdown. They'll end up winning the game, 30 to 26, inside Spano Stadium. And, and now, <laughs> and now you're on the desk with us here is head coach Tim Walsh. Tim, how are you doing today? Doing ready, I'm ready for a win. I'm doing much better than I was last Saturday night after watching that repeat performance right there. All right, well, after losing last week's game there in just the last minute, what has the focus been on the team going into practice this week and coming into the game? What kind of technicalities have you guys been working on this week? I think number one, it's for us, you know, we have a breakdown almost in critical situations. We probably could be five and two if we didn't have some breakdowns. I mean, you just showed one of them. You know, I mean, he's uncovered, yet there is a guy assigned to him. And it's unfortunate that we didn't play the coverage right, and it cost us a football game. We have to have 11 guys doing the right thing at all times. If one guy doesn't, that's the result that you're going to have. So our focus has been on offense, defense, and special teams. The 11 guys on the field respecting the guys that don't get to play by how they perform on the field. No, no mental mistakes, no breakdowns that allow touchdowns as easy as that one was. And an extremely tough team coming in tonight with Sacramento State, number eight team in the nation. And, you know, obviously a, a bit of a surprise team, I think, for the Big Sky uh, turning around from their season last season, but not a surprise to you, I believe. How did you kind of know Sacramento State could kind of break through this season? Well, I was asked a question by the commissioner of the Big Sky about 15 or 20 years ago when I was at Portland State. What, what's the best job as far as winning and losing in the Big Sky? And I said, Sacramento State might be it when they get the right coach. And right now they got the right coach. The players are believing in what they're doing. They're explosive on offense. They're physical on defense. Uh, they've beaten some really good opponents and beaten them bad. Uh, so they deserve to be ranked where they are, and they deserve it because of how they're playing as a football team and how they're believing in what they do. And jumping into the team's offense this year, we have Hamler at quarterback and Zui Tran Sanson as a fullback. And then we also have J.J. Koski out there as a receiver. What is it like as a coach running a team with this kind of strong offense, these three key players that constantly bring it? Yeah, I think we're pretty – our skilled players are pretty good players. I mean, Jalen Hammer, I've said all along, he's not – he hasn't reached his ceiling. He, he's going to be a work in prog progress, but we can see exactly what he can be by how he's performed so far. Uh, he's going to be an extremely talented player as the year goes on and as his eligibility goes on. Uh, but J.J. Koski, I think he's got an NFL caliber receiver. Zui's big, strong, and fast, and learning how to play that position better every week. 
Uh, so we feel like we do have some skilled players. Quentin Harrison needs to be mentioned probably in that same breath. He's done a great job as well. So uh, we got to find a way to be a little bit more explosive tonight, and hopefully we can do that and let those guys make some plays that aren't just 14 or 15 play drives that we can score in two or three plays. How have you seen Jalen grow as a player as the season has gone on? Well, there's no doubt his understanding of what he's supposed to do grows each week. And I think having, you know, having the opportunity to play under fire in games is the best way to learn. And, and his learning curve has been extremely good uh, ever since he started to compete for the job in the summer. Uh, he's done a tremendous job. But he invests time mentally in the game, too, which a quarterback has to. Uh, but he's explosive with his feet. He throws the deep ball exceptionally well. And he's been pretty accurate overall, probably more accurate than we thought as the years progressed. So like I said before, uh, he's been a pleasure to coach. He loves the game. He's enthusiastic, he's energetic, he's a leader by uh, how he works, and I think great things are about to happen for him and for our football team because of his talents. And jumping off the field for a second, what do you think that this football team's team chemistry, how does that kind of affect the players and how do you see it kind of pan out on the field? Well, there's no question, I do think we're a tight football team and I think we've proven that by how we battled back in games to give ourselves opportunity to win, even though some of them we didn't come through in the end to get the W. I think they battled and they fought together. I think that shows the belief they have in each other. Being a Cal Poly, a Division One football player at Cal Poly is not an easy deal. I mean, you know, getting up in the morning when they get up, going to the training room, the weightlifting, and then you look at the class schedule and the academic schedule that we have here, it's a, t it's a grinding day. It's a grind. And one of the things we have to do as coaches is make sure we try to keep them as fresh as possible as the year goes on. But I think they all respect each other because they all go through the same thing day in and day out. So therefore, that leads to a great chemistry as well. Sacramento State, the team here leading the Big Sky in both offense and defense. Uh, with head coach, first year head coach Troy Taylor, you know, what, what about Troy Taylor makes him so hard to play against? Well, I've known Troy for a long time. I mean, Troy played in the NFL and uh, had a, a great career at Cal as a quarterback, went on to coach at Cal, uh, decided that the college thing wasn't his deal. He went to, did the high school thing in a couple of different places and was extremely successful. And uh, had the opportunity to move on to Eastern Washington five or six years ago, from Eastern Washington to Utah, and now back home where he's from, Sacramento, California, where he has some pride in the city and he's developed some pride there. And I knew when they hired him that th they were gonna get better and they were gonna get better in a hurry because of Troy Taylor. He's done a tremendous job and the thing about him on offense is he's gonna spread the ball around. You don't know who the guy is tonight. They got a running back that might be the best running back in the league. They got a quarterback that might be the best quarterback in the league. They have a couple of wide receivers that are extremely explosive and they're all gonna touch the ball six, seven or eight times and you don't know when. And you better not give up any big plays. He thrives on making big plays. So we're gonna have to limit those things, but Troy's a tremendous coach and done a great job. All right, and last question here. We are home inside San Luis Obispo, inside Spano Stadium. What are these home games in this stadium? What does that bring to the momentum of the team? Well, there's no doubt. I mean, we I mean, we played well here this year. We just haven't won a couple of them. I mean, that's unfortunate, but it's a fact. And now we're in our fourth home game, and we need to start winning at home again. It's an important ingredient in any college football team, but this is a great college setting. Uh, with our marching band and all the things that surround the game, it has a great atmosphere, and we got to take advantage of the atmosphere that's created here, and we got to take advantage of it by how we play. And uh, we need to play more consistently and more maturely if we're going to win football games against good teams, because this conference, whether you're playing at Spano Stadium or you're playing in Sacramento, week in and week out, you're going to be playing great football teams, and we need to get one tonight. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us, Coach Walsh. We always appreciate you having on the show. Don't go anywhere. After the break, we'll have more Mustang game day for you guys. Cal Poly students are diving in for the upcoming New Year's 2020 Tournament of Roses. In between classes and on weekends, students have been prepping this year's float, which is being transported to Cal Poly's sister Pomona campus, this year's theme, Aquatic Aspirations. There's a lot of collaboration that needs to happen when we're putting the two halves together. Basically what we're doing today is putting our half of the chassis onto a semi-truck, shipping it down to Pomona so that we can put the two abs together and complete the float. The chassis is the foundation of the float. It takes two operators, one driving the float, while the second controls the float's hydraulic animated parts. Every year students and volunteers construct required welded steel and wired frames. Our float is going to uh, feature a submarine that is basically discovering undersea life. This New Year's Eve will mark Cal Poly's 72nd appearance at the 131st Tournament of Roses in Pasadena, California. From this week forward, San Luis Obispo students will be driving the approximately four hour trip down to the Pomona University on the weekends and during the winter break to work on the completion of the float. For more information, 
visit the ASI Cal Poly's webpage and click on Cal Poly Rose Float to sign up for Deco Week. I am Felix Castillo with Mustang News. things that I'm trying to work on. It's not one specific thing. I, I kind of want to work on my blocking. I'm really bad at it, but I'm trying, you know? I guess understanding the offense a little bit more, like where people actually go during the plays, instead of just trying to read it and go, just trying to wing it. Usually I just wing it. Don't tell my coach that. Zoe Tran Sampson stepping into the shoes of Joe Prother and telling a little bit more about his development. We have with us running back coach Aristotle Thompson. Thank you so much for joining us today. Appreciate you guys having me. Thank you very much. Yeah, so we just had Zoe talking a bit about learning how to block a bit. So has that been something you've been working on recently? Well, it's been things we've been working on with him for a while now. I mean, Zoe is a, a taller player than a lot of the running backs that we have here. So working with him and getting an understanding of how to use better leverage, bending his knees and not bending at his waist, you know, those are things that will help him with a bigger body guy. But for the most part, Zoe runs into people with this speed, he'll be okay blocking. All right, and actually last game, Zoe had 40 carries in the game. Um, I believe only three shy of the current record, which is held by Joe Prothero. What kind of was clicking out there last game for him on the field? Well, you know, Zoe just did a really good job of finding lanes in there, finding creases in there, and falling forward for extra yards. And so when you find somebody with a hot hand like that, you want to keep relying on them. There were some things schematically that the other team was doing that said, hey, stay in this. And so we stayed with it a little bit. So hopefully, you know, we don't have to get him that high of a carry total to get him up into, you know, 200 yards or so. But, you know, if called on, he's able to do it. And he showed that he's capable. And for Zui to come into this season after having only one run in last season, what, how have you seen him progress over the course of this season here? Well, you know, as we get into the recruiting process with these guys, we start to identify who guys that we think are going to be able to fit the mold and fill the void. And so last season, Joe Prothero was really just a dominant figure. And so we didn't really need to exude, you know, Zooey into the, into the lineup. But as you go through practice and you start to groom those guys for the role, you already see what they're able to do. Just the fans are the ones who don't see it because he's not playing on Saturdays. But you see the growth. You see the development in practice on a daily basis. So he may have only had one carry last season in a game but he had probably 50 or 60 in practice. All right, let's go talk about some of the other guys. We have Drew Hernandez, and we also have Xavier Moore. What do these guys, along with Zui, kind of what elements do they also bring to this lineup? Well, Andrew Hernandez, he, he brings an element of toughness and discipline. You know, Andrew Hernandez is a young man who walked on here from De La Salle High School, and De La Salle is one of the most storied program, high school programs in the nation. And so he brings a certain level of resilience and toughness to it, and so we're really able to rely on him to do the little things right all the time. Xavier Moore is a different guy. You know, he, he is a more built like a wide receiver, but he has a toughness of a running back. So he brings a hybrid mentality to it that he can get out and we can split him out to run some routes. We can also hand the ball off to him and get the ball pitched to him as well. So he presents a, a little bit different challenge to opponents than a guy like Andrew Hernandez does. Yeah, so obviously really tough team here at Sacramento State. What are your just, you know, initial thoughts of this matchup? Well, you know, I'm excited for this opportunity. Anytime you get to play another school from the state of California, you kind of get to put a little bit of bragging rights for, for where you're at. And so the last time Sacramento State was here, it didn't end well for us. And we were able to go up there to their place last year and do some good things. So I think that for our team to really just take it in and say, hey, this is where we play. This is what we do. Another opponent, it doesn't matter who they are. They're faceless. You know, they've been doing some good things, but you know what? It's a new day new team, let's go out there and let's do what we do, play our style of football, take it one play at a time, and let's get it done in the end. All right, Coach, and now for the fun part of the show, having you on here, we're going to break down a few of the plays from some of the recent games here. Let's go ahead and get that up on the screen, and we can just talk us through this first play here, Montana State game. So just a triple option play around the side. You see guys doing a good job of blocking on the perimeter. Andrew Hernandez just being what he is. It's a guy who's doing the right stuff in the right spot at the right time. Jalen Hamler with a good pitch here. Quinton Harrison over there finishing a block. And, you know, Drew's trying to get his way to the paint. You know, he probably got a little more grief because he didn't get to the end zone. But still a solid run, though. All right, let's take a look at our second play. It's from the UC Davis game. 
Uh, this is a really, really fun run for us. So, Kalepi Latimua, a uh, guy who we won't have out on the field tonight, he has another injury. But him just really working hard and putting in the extra effort. And you see multiple guys blocking downfield. You see Xavier Moore coming into the picture here with a nice screen off that they actually threw a penalty flag on, but it was not a penalty. They waved it off. So, good job by the officials being smart. Yeah, and this other third play here, we're going to have another Lepi Latimua play. This is a little fly sweep play that we have in our, our package, and Kalepi did a really good job of seeing an inside seam and sticking his foot in the dirt and getting vertical on it. You know, he broke a couple tackles there, and you know, when we get Kalepi back, which we will, we got to find more ways to get the ball in his hands because he's a special football player. You know, I'm not sure if you guys remember some of the guys we've had in the past: Corey Garcia, Deontay Williams. He's kind of in that mold, so we got to find ways to get the ball in his hands more, which will make Zui more explosive, which will make more lanes open up to, for Jalen to throw to JJ. So we got to continue to get those other guys involved in what we do, and you'll see Mustang football going back to where it needs to be. We're gonna t we have a lot more about Zooey Trans Sampson in the rest of the show, and you're in a bit of that content as well. Just really quick, do you want to preview? Just tell us a little bit about what Zooey is like. Zooey is an awesome guy. First off, he's always smiling. You will never see Zooey frowning. He is always smiling. He's energetic. He's happy. He's fun going. You know, he, he is not what you would think of when you say a typical football player. You know, he really has a, a great spirit about him. He is uh, very extroverted as well. You know, so he will engage in conversation with anybody. You know, it wouldn't surprise me if Zui didn't run up behind us here right now. You might want to look over your shoulder. He may be creeping up on you. He's not, but <laughs> that's what could happen, though. So, but no, Zui, he, he's a lot of fun. I mean, I, I think I did say uh, something earlier this week about seeing Zui rollerblade around campus. How many college students have you guys seen rollerblade around this campus? Well, I've seen Zui multiple times and in full pads at that. So he's just a great guy who cares about everyone always smiling always having a good time and he's just passionate about life you know i mean you, you can't ask for somebody to have a better outlook on life he's very passionate about every opportunity he has and you know never looks at anything negative you know he's always looking at things very positive so uh, that's probably one of the biggest reasons why i love the kids is, is that outlook on life all right coach thank you so much for your time here today not a problem. Appreciate you guys. Thank you very much. All right, we'll be back with more Mustang game day after the break. In terms of the broader environment. Analysis of the survey revealed that minority students, faculty, and staff have a more negative experience on Cal Poly's campus and experience a higher amount of discrimination. African American black students are 5.46 times more likely than white students at Cal Poly to report haven't been discriminated against. Cal Poly President Jeffrey Armstrong shared that he wasn't surprised by the findings, but is hopeful about steps Cal Poly is taking for the future. We knew that some students, faculty and staff, just not thriving and some just surviving. I was surprised by the um, consistency across the faculty, staff and students, and I was pleasantly surprised that um, our white population across students, faculty, and staff recognize, recognized at the degree that they did that our climate uh, is in need of getting better. The results come after a controversial image of possible Cal Poly students was posted on social media, which depicted people mocking undocumented immigrants. President Armstrong responded to the image at the presentation. So let me be perfectly clear. Every Mustang belongs to Cal Poly. Actions and behaviors that demean others have no place on our campus. Cal Poly plans to continue its diversity and inclusion program efforts in the future. But in a unique position that you are engaging this work with courage. In terms of getting out, putting the data out, good, bad, or indifferent. And challenging yourself to, to process it and to find the glimmers of hope and the opportunities to work together in partnership, collaboration, and community. Lauren Brown, Mustang News. And now that we know a little bit more, a little bit more about Zooey Trans Samson from Coach Thompson there, let's go ahead and take a look at some of the highlights so far from this season and kind of what Zooey has to say about his progress. Cal Poly fullback Zooey Tran Sampson has done a sensational job this season replacing all-time leading rusher Joe Prothrow and has established himself as a key cog in the Mustangs' fearsome rushing attack. 
While filling in Prothor's shoes is a monumental task, Transampton has maintained an even-keeled personality amid his on-field success. Well, all I, the only really difference between last year and this year is that I play now, which is kind of obvious if you're being a starter. But that's really it. It's just football. It's still football. That's, that's about it. Not only is Tran Sampson taking over the starting role, but he leads the Big Sky Conference in rushing yards at this point in this season. I think you should expect me to try hard, because that's really all I can do. You know, run hard every game. Well, there's different aspects to what we're trying to work with. Like, obviously we're trying to get better, we're trying to be more sound with our, with our offensive defense and just how we run plays and stuff. Away games, you know, we're always trying to get a gold nugget, which is a win. I want a gold nugget. A, a home games, we gotta defend the home, you know, wow the crowd. But anyway, just just get better every game. While the coaching staff is happy with his on-field production, they feel like this is only the beginning for Tran Sampson. And uh, we think, like I said before, his ceiling is extremely high as far as his talent level. I don't think a lot of people know how fast Zui is. You, know, you saw him rip off a run against San Diego. He's one of the faster guys in our program. Well, I don't think he's all the way there yet. He's got a ways to go, and he's got a ways to go to how to truly be that guy week in, day in, day out. And uh, that's probably the next step for him, is learning how to take it on as a daily thing rather than a weekly thing. He needs to get better every day. Uh, he's got a body. He's got uh, speed, size, strength. He's got all the things that you would look for that follow these play that position, and he's done it well, but his ceiling, he's not reached his top uh, level of performance yet. He's got a ways to go. Yep, a lot to unpack about Zoo, and we're gonna have a little bit more about him in the show, but for right now, let's learn a bit more about how Cal Poly football is doing. Sam, our own yeah, Samantha Smith is field level week. with Chris Sylvester. It's almost November with this type of weather, but uh, Cal Poly certainly not favored in this game. Maybe the, the wacky autumn weather will, will help the Mustangs get out of here with an upset win tonight. Yeah, I was going to ask you, we're playing, it's kind of a tough game for the Mustangs, playing Sac State. They're number one in the conference for offense and defense. What do you think it's going to take for the Mustangs to pull off a win today? Well, they call this a trap game for a team like Sacramento State, undefeated in the conference. They haven't lost to a team at this level, obviously, the FCS. Their only two losses have come to two pretty good FBS teams, Arizona State and Fresno State. And, and statistically, they've done everything right to this point. They beat three ranked opponents in a row. But for Cal Poly, they've often beaten themselves this year. You know, they led 17-7 at the half last week against North Dakota and, and let that slip away in the final 18 minutes of regulation. So, you know, now sitting at two and five, Playoffs aren't a possibility this year for this 2019 Cal Poly team. I hope that they come out and they play loose and they play relaxed and they just have fun because there's no pressure anymore. It's not a win or go home type scenario. They could win out and they're still not going to be a postseason team. Sacramento State has a lot more to lose than Cal Poly has to lose tonight. I think the Mustangs can uh, grab a big momentum gain if they get out of here with the win tonight. And it'd be great for all the young guys on this team. I know they've been scrapping and fighting hard, and it's been tough over this three-game losing streak. But uh, this this is a group that, that's confident. I, I heard throughout practice this week that everybody was still upbeat and really excited about the opportunity to take down a, a top-10 team here tonight. Yeah, and um, Zui is actually number one in rushing in the conference. How, what do you think of the season so far? It's How has like, he really transitioned from last year? Well, it, it's like, is that Joe Pro throw out there? I mean, you, you gotta, gotta do a double take. I mean, he's putting up those type of numbers. He only had one carry all of last year. His first carry this year on August 31st against San Diego went 87 yards for a touchdown. So he kind of got going quick. He's had some games where he's struggled, but in the triple option offense, the fullback is a byproduct of what the opposing defense is showing you. And last week, 40 carries, a career high, and yardage also scored a touchdown Cal Poly needs him to to run for over 100 yards in my mind to win this game tonight but Cal Poly has to expand outside of Zui Drew Hernandez one carry for 29 yards last week Lepi Lataimua one carry for 13 yards last week if you're getting anywhere from 13 to 29 yards a game you have to get the ball into your playmakers hands and watch out for the receivers Quentin Harrison JJ Koski you figure that Jalen Hamler Tim Walsh and company they're gonna try and involve them as much as they can in the offense to try and get big plays because 
if Sac State plays anything like they have to this point, they're going to score their points tonight. Cal Poly has to outscore them. That's the only way they're going to win this game. And who do you think are some key players Cal Poly really has to look for in this game? Yeah, like I mentioned, I, I think they have to have better slot back production. Guys like Drew Hernandez, Lepi Latimu, the receivers, Kofsky and Harrison that I mentioned. But for Cal Poly, it, it's defense. They, they had such a tremendous first half last week, holding a really good North Dakota team to just one touchdown in the first half. And things started to fall apart down, down the stretch. It's almost as if this team when they get ahead late in games, they play not to lose instead of playing to win. Instead of going full throttle, putting the foot on the gas pedal and, and running it down the opposition's throats, uh, they kind of just become a little more conservative, start to play a little more passively as well. So I'd just like to see them put together a full 60-minute effort tonight because that's what it's going to take to beat Sac State. Well, Chris, really appreciate you being out here with us today. Sydney and Brian, we're going to toss it back to you guys. Always great to hear from Chris Sylvester. We'll have more on Cal Poly football taking on Sacramento State after the break. Campus Sustainability Month is in full swing. But for environmental protection and management senior Jamie Himmler, living sustainably is an everyday practice. Himmler's quest for a sustainable lifestyle goes beyond shopping at farmers markets and reducing plastic waste. Since high school, Himmler has been dumpster diving for makeup, clothes, and more recently, her groceries. It's like going to the grocery store, but it's just all in the, in the trash. When Himmler came to Cal Poly, her interest in dumpster diving peaked after learning that over 40% of food in America goes to waste. We al almost felt like it was a duty of ours to dumpster dive. <laughs> As a junior, Himmler helped start Feel Alive, an organization with the goal of solving the issue of local food waste. Feel Alive repurposes food waste by selling products created entirely by ingredients found in dumpsters. Well, it's really about getting behind a mission that's way greater than yourself. Along with dumpster diving, Himmler strives for a sustainable lifestyle by biking to school, limiting food packaging, and reusing jars as water bottles and containers. What I've discovered is that for the most part, things that are sustainable, like sustainable practices, are also healthy practices. Like they really go hand in hand. For Mustang News, I'm Maya McGregor. Welcome, welcome back to Mustang Game Day. We now have a little bit of information on Cal Poly starting quarterback Jalen Hamler, who is currently first in the Big Sky Conference in passing efficiency, filling the role from Khalil Jenkins last year. We actually got a more analytical approach from him, and we took Jalen Hamler behind the play. Let's take a look. I'm Jalen Hamler, and I'm going to take you behind the play. This first play right here, um, this is a design quarterback run. So uh, basically, what we were getting all game, they played cover zero and they like to chase chase our slot backs. So this design run was, was like created to hit up inside. So I seen them over pursuit and that's when I cut back against the safety and then ran to the end zone. Hamler to the 20, 15, 10, five, touchdown. Third and 14, trying to get into the end zone. So basically I have a, I have a double concept. I have a one-on-one -on, -one on the backside, which I ended up hitting JJ on. So right now I have eyes on this guy right here. And once again, he's gonna tell me everything I wanna do with this play. So as the play goes on, he runs it out and he has to respect it because he's playing man, they're playing cover zero. And everybody's locked up. He's locked up here. He's locked up on Q and he's locked up on the outside receiver right here. So it's man across the board. So when that happens, this post ends up coming wide open across the field. He he tries to play inside leverage, but Q still ends up getting inside. And if he wins on that, then he can just call it a touchdown after that. Touch right at the 20, in between the hash marks to the 10. Touchdown, Cal Poly. Um, just a little double option off of this d defensive tackle right here. He ended up biting. So he probably would have gave got in too, but just a last minute decision. I feel like his body, he, his whole profile was turned towards him. So it was a good read to pull off of him and just find a way to get into the end zone. This guy tells me everything. All right, I have the lead blocker heading into the hole. Um, but if I don't like it, if he stays there, I have to respect it. I have to give Zui, and Zui would have had this, this all right there to walk into. But as he plays downhill, I'm just right off of that and right into the crease. And the line made great plays all night, and I just found a way to get into the end zone. It's like a field thing. I, I couldn't really like 
really explain it to you. It's just more of like after doing it for so many times, repping it so many times, you kind of know when you have them and when you don't. And now the Mustangs on the doorstep. This right here is just a rollout, a simple rollout to get the defense kind of off balance and um, play catch out there with Quentin. Coming out of my read, I'm reading low, high, to back and side. So right now, the low read, this is kind of jacked up, so I'm off of this fast. And when I get my eyes back up, if Quentin wins, then I'm gonna put the ball on him. If not, I would have came back inside to JJ right here. You see he has a lot of grass. He has a lot of grass to work with right here. So getting the ball with him would have been fairly easy as well as it was to get it to Q. We executed this perfectly. We got outside the pressure and um, just play catch. And I say reading the defense is understanding what I get before I get into those situations. Um, understanding what I need, understanding down the distance, what plays are good, what, what decisions are good in these situations, third and long, second and shorts. Do I want to take a sack here? Do I need to try to force this play here? You know what I'm saying? Just different things trying to manage the game. It's been nothing but a blessing to have the opportunity that I have and um, just trying to continue to get better every week. Always good to kind of get more info from the players themselves, see how they kind of think on the field. And for Jalen Hamler, a young guy, but really confident. Yeah, absolutely. It's great to hear from Jalen Hamler. So now we actually, after the break, are going to have more for you guys about uh, running back Zooey Tran Sampson, but a little bit more about his personality and what he brings to Cal Poly's sideline. So don't go anywhere. After the break, we'll have more Mustang game day. A variety of new businesses recently opened in downtown San Luis Obispo, including Burger Village, Athleta, Brown Butter Cookie Company, and the Van Store. Located on the 600 block of Higuera Street, Burger Village is serving up organic, antibiotic, and hormone-free products, according to their website. With bison, elk, and ostrich burgers, the new restaurant is definitely turning heads, but that isn't all they have to offer. On the vegetarian vegan side, we have the Impossible and Beyond, and it's super good veggie burgers, so those go like really quickly. They also have pint night and happy hours at varying times throughout the week. Three bucks for a booch craft or like a double IPA is really good, so catch me in here on my days off. For more information on their menu and hours, check out burgervillage.com. Athleta opened in August, offering a selection of women's athletic wear and filling the place of Gap, which closed in January. Brown Butter Cookie Company is also new to downtown Slow, offering the original brown butter sea salt cookies that made them a hit in Cayucas and Paso Robles. The Van Store recently replaced Chipotle in downtown Slow. Located on the 800 block of Higuera Street, the shoe store includes products such as skateboards, backpacks, and socks. Some of the most popular shoe styles include the black and white authentics and white slip-on Vans. It's something that happens that people come and ask, and I just want that, that's it, and they're done. You know, they know what they're looking for. For Mustang News, I'm Lauren Wallachy. Welcome back to Mustang Game Day. So as I was saying before the break, running back Zooey Tran Sampson brings a lot both on the field but also off the field onto the sideline. So I actually got the chance this week, we both did, to catch up with some teammates on the Cal Poly football team and ask them their first impressions of Zooey and kind of what he's added to their lives. Zooey is an eclectic man. I would say the word is he's different. Different, just, just different. Unique, charismatic. Zooey, Zooey's a character. That guy, you know, he's one of the happiest guys on the team. You know, we wake up at five in the morning, he's the first one that you see and he's always smiling. I think he's one of the happiest people I've ever met in my entire life. Zooey's just a character. It's like, I don't, I, it's, it's hard to really explain Zooey. You really can't put Zooey in a box. It's like, we'll be on the football field. Like, we just got done with a play, and I look back at Zooey, and Zooey's just smiling. I think the first time I talked to Zooey, he just gave me a smile. As much as he says that people think he's weird, I just think he enjoys life and is a pretty happy young man. I just go in there, and I'm like, what's up, bro? And he's just... So just stares at me and smiles, and I'm like, like, you good? And he just keeps smiling, and I'm like, all right. He got in trouble one time in practice, and he was getting yelled at, and you know, he was still smiling no matter what. I just know when I first got here, I'm like, eh, but <laughs> that's my guy, though. So I'm like, what's up, bro? He's like, just chilling, takes off his helmet and pulls a little candy bar. He, he has like stashed in his helmet out and starts eating, and I'm like, all right. At first it was kind of, because I didn't know what type of person Zooey was, once you get to know him, you, 
He's just, he, he's different, but a, a good different. Like, it's good to experience these type of people. He's just a good dude. He's a funny guy. You know, he seems quiet, but he, he actually talks a lot. Can't really be down talking to Zuli. Like, he'll get you out of situations, right? If you get mad on the field, he'll tell you it's not worth it. Regardless of the on the field stuff, like off the field, he's somebody I'm glad that I met. And he, he brings a different type of fun and love to this game, which I appreciate. Zui off the field. Let's kind of switch gears onto on the field. We have our three key players tonight, and our first key player is one and only Zui Tran Sampson. Zui Tran Sampson, I mean, he's a big personality, but also a big guy on the field. 6'2", 215 pounds. He's a big guy to be having in that fullback position, uh, subbing to Joe Prothero's shoes. He's a number one rusher in the big sky. He's got 90 yards per game, four touchdowns on the season. Last game, 40 carries. That's just three shy of Joe Prothero's record of 43 yards, uh, 43 carries that he had last season. So yeah, Zui Tran Sampson just really like, really stepping into this role as a sophomore after only carrying once last game, really impressive work by him. Yeah, so also on our second key player for this game coming up, it's redshirt freshman quarterback, Jalen Hamler. Jalen Hamler standing at 6'1", 195 pounds, currently leading the Big Sky in passing efficiency, 955 passing yards with nine touchdowns, also 412 yards rushing with seven touchdowns. So another guy just like Dewey stepping into a big role of Khalil Jenkins from last year, and he considers himself a dual threat, which is kind of what you want from a quarterback, and his teammates know that, his coaches know that, and most importantly, he knows that he is a dual threat, and a lot of people have been saying, just let Hamler be Hamler. You can see in some of these plays, he can throw, he can toss, he can run, and as long as they give him the freedom to do that, he'll and, do it. And he's a confident guy. I mean, we saw in that behind the play, he's breaking down those plays very well, and he's explaining his whole thought process, and it's really well thought out. So he's, you know, he's a young guy, wretched freshman, but he got to learn from some great guys, Dano Graves, Khalil Jenkins, and he's really stepping into that role now. Right, and our third and final key player of the night is Matt Shotwell, kind of a name we haven't mentioned so far in the show. Yeah, Matt Shotwell on the defensive side, the junior linebacker. He's number six in tackles in the big sky, first and Cal Poly in tackles, 61 tackles on the season. He also led Cal Poly last season with about 90, 90 or so tackles, I believe. And yeah, Matt Shotwell, also part of a really big line of Shotwell brothers that have played at Cal Poly. He's the fourth Shotwell, the wear the Mustang jersey and yeah I mean he's really stepping up he's one of the team captains as well and we're gonna hear a little bit more about him uh, in just a second but yeah Matt Shotwell um, I mean it's a big task today to be facing against this Sacramento State team and also a lot of pressure coming off that you know with three older brothers who all played for this program obviously this program means a lot to their family and kind of having to step into that role now as the youngest Shotwell brother playing for this program and taking it on you know head on now as team captain and a big guy making big plays on the field yeah and we actually got to hear a little more about Matt Shotwell we have a soundbite from him uh, just kind of with how I believe it's about uh, his um, about the family legacy that he has here with the Mustangs. yeah so, a little so. bit about the pros and cons you know he kind of talks about what it's like to have three older brothers who play for the same program as him. Yeah, so let's hear from Matt Shotwell. Being able to go back to my family, like to my brothers, and say like, uh, like hey, what was what was different? What was the same? What would you, what did you guys do? Like, what's uh, just like in the, when they come back and they see all the things I've changed, like the practice field, the locker room, like just how much everything's changed is like pretty awesome to see. And then also having uh, Coach Walsh, Coach At, coaches that actually coach my brothers is pretty awesome. Being able to talk with them. Yeah, and we'll have more about Matt Shotwell. We'll hear from his parents, uh, Steve and Cindy Shotwell, after the break. In terms of the broader environment. And I'll point out here. Analysis of the survey revealed that minority students, faculty, and staff have a more negative experience on Cal Poly's campus and experience a higher amount of discrimination. African-American black students are 5.46 times more likely than white students at Cal Poly to report having been discriminated against. Cal Poly President Jeffrey Armstrong shared that he wasn't surprised by the findings, but is hopeful about steps Cal Poly is taking for the future. We knew that some students, faculty and staff, just not thriving and some just surviving. I was surprised by the um, consistency across the faculty, staff, and students. And I was pleasantly surprised that um, our white population across students, faculty, and staff 
recogni recognized at the degree that they did that our climate uh, is in need of getting better. The results come after a controversial image of possible Cal Poly students was posted on social media, which depicted people mocking undocumented immigrants. President Armstrong responded to the image at the presentation. So let me be perfectly clear. Every Mustang belongs to Cal Poly. Actions and behaviors that demean others have no place on our campus. Cal Poly plans to continue its diversity and inclusion program efforts in the future. But in a unique position that you are engaging this work with courage in terms of getting out, putting the data out, good, bad, or indifferent, and challenging yourself to, to process it and to find the glimmers of hope and the opportunities to work together in partnership, collaboration, and community. Lauren Brown, Mustang News. Welcome back to Mustang Game Day. So we actually have reporter Sam Spitz down at field level once again, but this time we have Matt Shotwell's parents with her. Sam, what's going on down there? Thanks, guys. I'm here with junior linebacker Matt Shotwell's family, Cindy and Scott. Steve. Steve, Cindy and Steve. Um, I just want to ask you, how was Matt feeling at the beginning of the season? I think he was really pumped up, ready to go. He worked really hard through the summer to get himself physically ready. So I think he was ready to go. And Matt was named key team captain of the football team this year. Um, for the second game of the for year. For the second game of the year, yeah. What, what was your reaction to this? Oh, I think he was honored to do that. Um, he's a... He's, He's, grow he's grown up as a leader. He's always been a leader, and I think that it was kind of natural for him, and I, he's worked hard for that, and um, hopefully that will continue on for the rest of this year and in the next year as well. He can continue to be a leader that the team needs. What kind of leadership qualities does Matt have that make him a good leader? I think for sure his work ethic is, um, you know, uh, very endearing. I think people love to, they, they see him working very hard. Um, they seem very disciplined. He's dedicated and focused. Um, these are just things that I think that, you know, really help, you know, spearhead the kind of leadership that the team needs. So. And he's leading the team now in tackles. How have you seen him improve over the years? Probably should ask. <laughs> Well, I think he's just trying to, you know, be more involved um, and help the team out in every way he can. Um, they've got him doing a lot more in the area of pass coverage this year because he can run and he can he can cover uh, receivers really well. They've got him doing a lot of that. So I think he's just looking to figure out ways to help the team win and be better every year. So um, hey, that's that's what his focus is. And Matt is the fourth Shotwell to play here at Cal Poly. Now, what does that mean to you guys about having? All of your sons come to Cal Poly and play. Well, we're, we're, we're very, very blessed. I, I played football. It's been in our life um, forever. Um, it's just been great. And we've just been very, very blessed to have very four very talented boys that all also were very strong leaders and hard workers and great athletes. Great, got their athleticism from their mom, fortunately. But, um, you know, they were just always fun growing up, always great athletes. and. We're able to kind of work hard enough to where they had this opportunity to go to Cal Poly and play this kind of football and be at this kind of institution and it's been really, really special. So we've been very, very blessed and um, we've had a continuation of our family from here. Our, so both of our daughters-in-laws went to Cal Poly as well, two of our three daughters-in-laws. So we're very excited and very blessed. Now have the boys always grown up playing football? Were they involved in other sports? They grew up playing YFL football down in Santa Barbara Goleta area and they also all played baseball and soccer but that kind of dwindled off by the time they had junior high and high school and they started to focus just on football. So was Matt always going to come to Cal Poly or was he looking at other schools? I think it was kind of a given that if he gets the opportunity he's going to go to Cal Poly. Yeah. What, how would you say that football has influenced Matt's life growing up? Well, again, I, I think that because he saw his brothers, he was, I mean, when he was he was two years old playing over here underneath the scoreboard while the team was playing on the field. So he really didn't know anything other than Cal Poly football. And, and 
seeing what football was able to do for his brothers, um, I, I think was just something that he always wanted to also be able to do and work hard to be able to accomplish that, which he's done. What do you think are the key things that have made Matt so successful in his football career? Well, Matt's a, he's a, he is a great athlete. Um, he's a great athlete, but he works really, really, really hard. He's got great instincts, very dedicated, um, just does all the right things to make himself the kind of player and teammate and leader and student uh, that he can be, the best that he can be. And um, I think that's, you know, it, it's paid off for him, all of his hard work. And is there any specific memory that you have of Matt when he was growing up playing football, maybe from the mom, the only woman in the house <laughs> with, the, with the five boys? Um, I think one of the mo fun memories that I have is when he was playing their uh, high school rival and he won the MVP of the game. That's a tradition that the two rival schools and they give a trophy, and Matt won that trophy. That was really special. And he was a junior that year when he won that. Another fun thing I remember, I wasn't there, I didn't see it, but Matt, when he first came on campus at Cal Poly, he went up into Mott Gym, and there was a huge banner on the wall at Mott Gym of the football team. And he goes, hey, that's me. And he was five years old, sitting on Chris Gokong's shoulders in a big football banner there. And, you know, so after they had won, I think, the Davids game, they had the horseshoe. So, yeah, that was a fun thing. Well, thank you both so much for joining us here today. Uh, looking forward to a great game. We wish Matt luck. Back to you guys. So it all started when I was talking to Jesse, um, and he asked if I wanted to um, kind of provide music for one of the events. It was me and then him and then Luke Eveslaj, us three, were DJing that night. Um, so that's kind of my, how I got my foot in the door. Um, and then once both them kind of graduated and left the school, um, they kind of handed it down to me and gave me all the contacts. The music scene has definitely changed um, over the past couple years. And so I think what they wanted to do is kind of provide their own twist on music and music that the Cal Poly student body likes um, so that people are more inclined to go to the bars and not necessarily stay up um, near, the, near the school. It makes them essentially go downtown. There's four of us that essentially run it. And we all know different types of people. And so what the, reason, the reasoning behind kind of us four doing the behind the scenes work and kind of making this happen is that we can kind of touch almost every part of the Cal Poly student body and kind of get the word out so that we can get the most people to our events and kind of make it, you know, yeah, as fun as possible. It's definitely awesome to, you know, be up on stage and kind of be the one providing music for a bunch of people who are, who are going downtown and who are um, going to like talk to their friends and hang out with their friends and it definitely makes me feel good you know when you look down and it's like 11 30 at night and like it's all your friends and all of the people that there's also people you don't know but it's just it's all pretty much the Cal Poly student body all in one place all having a great time so it definitely makes me feel good. Just being consistent a lot of the you look at a lot of games that we've had we just haven't really been consistent from start to finish. We've either had bad starts, good finishes, um, good starts, bad finishes, or in between periods where we're just not really clicking and we just want to play a consistent, sound, full game of football. Mustang game day. And now after hearing a little bit about what Jaylen Hamler has to say, we actually have color commentator for the Mustang, Vernon VJ Husky joining us today. Thanks so much for coming on game day with us. As always, thank you so much. It's great to see you two wonderful folks again. And so, um, Hamler actually just talked about in that clip can, the importance of consistency and how the team has been lacking that, you know, last game, losing there in the last two minutes of the fourth quarter. What are your kind of thoughts on their consistency so far this season? Well, I, I tell you, Sydney, it's been one of the things that has really actually baffled me and not much baffles me when I cover the great game of football. But uh, they either start very good and end bad, or they start bad and they end very good. It could be focus, it could be confidence, it could be a lot of different things. But I do know if they ever put together a solid 60 minutes of football, instead of two and five, they can be five and two. The, re the record can be reversed. So I think a lot of it has to do with focus, and I think everybody, all the players, all the coaches, everybody has to stay engaged for 60 minutes. That's what makes this game so great. You can't just give the ball to one guy and let him score 60. Can't worry about your cleanup hitter going three for four or two home runs, or your goaltender just being, you know, a stone in the goalie net and not allowing anything in. All 11 guys and 53 on the sideline, all the coaches, everybody's got to be involved 60 minutes. 
such a tough opponent coming in today, Sacramento State in Spano Stadium. And they're a team that the Mustangs probably want to be. They're a team that turned around from a tough season last season and are now leading the big sky. So what's kind of your impression on the Sacramento State team? Listen, man, this Hornet squad is impressing me. You used the very right word right there. Uh, last year not being very good. And then this year, going up last weekend, what they did to Montana was shocking. I mean, that was probably the most shocking score I saw in the big sky this year. They're fast, they're aggressive, but I got to give a shout out to the coaching staff. They're very well coached, and they have a lot of guys that come off that staff and go to other FCS schools and get jobs as coordinators and head coaches. So they have a program there as far as their coaching goes. And to me, that's that's like 80% of football is coaching. You got to coach your kids up. You got to get good game plan in there. You got to get good technique. You got to practice. You got to drill them on it. And I think they do a great job at that. And I think last year team was young. They have a year of experience too, man. They're like that middle age, a lot of seniors, uh, sophomores and juniors who are playing really well for them. So I'm super, super impressed by Sacramento State. Yeah, and you talked a bit about their coaching staff. Troy Terry, their first year head coach. I mean, how difficult is it for a head coach to come in your first year at a school and then to find success? How difficult, how rare is that to find in a program? Well, number one is rare, but I don't think it's difficult. And I'm gonna tell you why. I believe when you are a new coach, you have a, a blank canvas. If I gave you a blank canvas, you can start with what you want. Your starting point is going to be the main focal point of the, the completed project in the end. So if I'm a new coach coming in, the first thing I do is I change the culture. This is how we're going to practice. This is how we're going to study. This is how we're going to eat. This is how we're going to run. This is how we're going to block. This is how we're going to pad. This is how we're going to do it across the board. If you can do that and implement that, man, it's it's it, it could turn into a really, really great situation, as you see here. And I think he did a very good job of that. Everybody bought into what he was selling. And as a guy with 25 years in the sales industry, people purchase from who they like, and their kids like him. All right, let's talk about Matt Shotwell for a second. Currently leading the team's defense with 61 tackles, actually sixth in the Big Sky Conference in tackles. What have you been seeing out there on the field from Matt Shotwell? Well, Cindy, if you remember the last time I was here, I made a comment that I wanted to see him be more aggressive. I didn't want him sitting on his heels or sitting flat-footed. I wanted him on the balls of his feet, on the stones, and attack it because I think that's where he's great. And he, that game out here against Montana State was the last time we were here. He got back to that, and I think that's what's helped him get back to the attacking, tackling machine that he is. And it's in his lineage, man. He's the fourth Shotwell brother here, and his brother was a linebacker award winner when he was here, too. So it's in his DNA. He's got all the talent in the world, man. So I'm glad to see him being aggressive again. Kind of, as we say in football, pin your ears back and just go. Yeah, and as you're saying, last game, he had his season high 13 tackles, eight of those solo tackles as well. So, I mean, tough opponent here with Sacramento State. What's kind of the key to defending the Sacramento State team? Tackling. The defense for Cal Poly this year, they're number one Achilles all year long. It's been tackling. They have moments where they miss a lot of tackles and they run it back to break tackles. You've got to wrap this team up because that is an aggressive team, that is a fast team, and they got a lot of guys, man, that could create big plays from a five yard screen pass or a pitch play. And if the edge or the corner or the guy that should make the tackle doesn't make the tackle, it could be a long day. So they must tackle well today. Let's switch up gears a little bit and talk about Zooey Tran Sampson, the player we've been talking about almost all show now. 40 carries last game, currently leading the conference in rushing yards. What is clicking out there on the field for him? I think it's really easy for him. I had a chance to talk with his dad back in Southern Utah. And, uh, and number one, he comes from very good people. When you come from good people, then your mindset's good. You work hard. You, have, you put your heart, your passion. And I think that's what he does, number one. Number two, he's a big kid. If you've ever stood next to this kid face to face, he's much bigger than he looks from the stands or from the press box. And uh, he sees the hole very well. And I like him most because he gets better as the game goes on. That's why I call him the, the human Tonka truck, because he just goes, man. And it, it, as the game goes on, it gets harder to tackle him. And I'm pretty sure the defenders get sick of tackling him. Last week, you had 40 carries. It's a lot of times tackling that guy, man. So I think he sees everything well. He runs hard. And I've never seen a guy trip for more yards in my life than when he trips, he falls four yards forward. It's like, how do you, most guys trip and fall? He trips and keeps his balance for two more steps and dives, sticks the ball out. Just He's just a football player, and he's a really good one. Right, well, BJ, thank you so much for joining the show today. Thank you for having me. I love you guys, man. You guys know that, man. Go Mustangs. Yep, have a great call in the day. And now we're going to be transitioning over to our three keys for the Mustangs after the break. A weathered sign faded from 23 years of disappearance. I didn't realize that Kristen Smart had gone missing like 30 minutes away from my house. Chris Lambert knows Kristen Smart's story better than anyone. So this is every news article that's ever been printed about Kristen Smart. 
This is like everything that's in any way connected to Kristen or her disappearance um, from, you know, 1996. I think her family was kind of overwhelmed to see this all called together in one place. It's kind of like reliving a really tough time in their lives. He's been following her case for more than a year, documenting Kristen's story. I have the cover of the first Mustang Daily from when she started in 1995. An article from the LA Times by Peter King, published back in 2006, sparked Lambert's interest in Kristen's case. At the very end of our phone call, um, and it's the how I end that conversation, is he said, uh, I think maybe your documentary is the legacy of my article. And I almost cried when he said that to me on the phone. It was like, oh my God, that's so moving that you think that that I could take this further than you did. But it was the face on a billboard that inspired Lambert to dive deeper into her case. Part of the inspiration for doing something like this is that it's gone on for so many years that she's just sort of fading from public memory. Creating a podcast. It's different when someone goes missing in your own backyard. Documenting who Kristen Smart was. on it last May and all through up until the winter time I kept dropping it and picking it up again and going I don't know if I can tell a story on this scale it's going to be like a five-hour documentary essentially which is beyond anything I've ever attempted to do an idea that has now consumed his life I quit my job in May so that I could do this full-time and do it right carrying around tools wherever he goes. A shotgun mic and a field recorder, a notebook. In hopes to shed light on her story. Focus right on that side there. Just like this sign, which has been up for far too long, as Kristen has been missing longer than she was alive. It's a very unusual circumstance where it's been allowed to go 23 years without a resolution, and they still get to say, it's open and active and we're working on it all the time. Your Own Backyard was released in October of 2019. And while Lambert has uncovered so much about the case. I think this is probably about six months of going through every newspaper archive. The one question remains. Well, where is Kristen right now? Where is her body at? Because it's somewhere, it's somewhere within driving distance of my house and I really want to I really want to know what happened to her. Sydney Brandt, Mustang News. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Welcome back to Mustang Game Day. So we usually have three keys to success for the usually football three. team. But tonight we have one Just simple one. key for the Mustangs. Stay engaged. Yeah, stay engaged. It's actually, it was our first key to Three weeks ago, when we had our first Mustang game today, it was stay engaged. It's got to play, you know, play until the end of the game. And that's kind of been what we just talked to VJ about. Cal Poly, they've had this tendency to have leads um, in two of the last three games. They led going into the third to the fourth quarter, and then they lost that lead going into the end of it. And it's really important to stay engaged here because even though they have five losses on the season, probably out of the playoff picture, they still have to want to finish out the season well, prepare for the next season, finish well for the seniors on this team. Right, and also taking a look at, you know, Sacramento State, currently ranked 8th in the nation, 3-0 and in Big West Conference. They are undefeated. So you can't come out into a game like this. I mean, yeah. really against any opponent in the Big Sky Conference, but especially a team like these Hornets, where you're going to have to come out strong from the first play to the very last play. Yeah, and let's take a look at the standings right now, because Sacramento State, the season they've put together, 5-2 and two overall, 3-0 and oh in conference. They haven't lost to an FCS school. Their two losses were to FBS schools, and they were both close wins for them, or close losses for them. Cal Poly right now sitting uh, third to last right now, 2-5 and five overall. I mean, yeah, they're on a three-game losing streak. They're looking to break it today. Right, and Sac State also averaging 41 points per game, which is quite shocking, as VJ was saying, what they did to Montana State last week. We're going to yeah. hope that, that Cal Poly can, you know, you guys like Matt Shotwell can yep. pick it up tonight and lead that Cal Poly defense. And that goes into our key, stay engaged. Ignore the rankings, ignore the standings, ignore the statistics here that put Sacramento State in the lead. Cal Poly, they are the underdog and they have to play like it. And VJ said, Sacramento State, a lot to lose here. Cal Poly, nothing to lose. Sacramento State, they could lose They could lose their first ever game to an FCS school today. Cal Poly for sure wants to be the team to do that. Right, and Cal Poly did actually beat them last season. 
Um, so you never know. I mean, maybe they can beat them again this season. So just as long as they stay engaged. That's all we have for you for Mustang Game Day this week. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Sydney Finkel. And I'm Brian Trong. We'll see you next time.